All right. Mrs. Nova. So we have two stars here. One of them is a G star, like the sun. This yellow one is a G star, like the sun. This one here is a bigger. It's an F star. So it's kind of like yellowish white on the surface. All right, so this one is more massive. This one is least massive. Does anybody know which one is going to evolve first, F star or a G star? The bigger one, F. All right, who was that? Cindy. Cindy. Cindy, Costa. Cindy who? Costa. C O S T A. Yeah, got you. Thank you. Yeah, Three Cindy's in the class, actually. Oh. Thank you, Cindy Costa. That's right. Now, you said the bigger one. Is the bigger one also more massive? Yes. That's the key. That's right. The more massive one will evolve first. All right. That's right. This guy's going to evolve first. And F stars are like the, you know, the Mary Poppins stars. They last a long time, maybe four billion years. So this guy's going to last a long time. And so it's going to evolve first. Before the G star, the G star takes 10 billion years to evolve. This guy only takes maybe 4 billion years to evolve. All right, so this guy, the F star is going to evolve first. It's going to become a red giant, right? All right, after the red giant, it's going to become a white dwarf. So now it turned to a white dwarf. Now, this is a binary system, meaning there's more than one and two stars, right? Binary, two. So we got a binary system, in fact, most of the stars are binaries. About two thirds of them are binary. So we're lucky to have a single star. It doesn't seem like life evolves the same way in a binary star as it does in a single star system. Uh, I guess you guys saw the double star system in, in uh, Star Wars, right? The very first Star Wars, they showed two stars in the sky. Okay, so now this guy's gone white dwarf, right? So we have a white dwarf with a G star here. Now, eventually, the white dwarf is going to get older and older and older. It's time for it to become a red giant now. So it's going to become a red giant. Now, watch what happens here. When it becomes a red giant, it's so much closer to the white dwarf now. So remember, these red giant stars, they uh, lose a lot of their upper layers because they're making too much energy. So as he loses the upper layers, some of that stuff is going to escape onto the white dwarf. And it covers the surface of the white dwarf. This is hydrogen coming in. So some hydrogen is coming in because now the red star is so much closer. It's much bigger now. It used to be a G star, so it's pretty far away. But now it's much, much closer. So some of this gas escape, and they gather around the white dwarf in something called an accretion disk. That's what happens. So they start orbiting it for a while. Now. Gravitationally, they start settling down on the white dwarf. And it's kind of like putting um, insulation on your water heater. If you insulate your water heater, you know, you don't lose heat as much. So the surface of the white dwarf is maybe 30, 40,000 degrees. But it starts gaining temperature. So it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. Maybe after 10,000 years, it collects enough hydrogen that the temperature goes up to maybe two, three million degrees on the surface of the white dwarf. Now, white dwarf doesn't make any energy, but it collected just now lots and lots of hydrogen. So when the hydrogen is hot enough, it's going to start fusing on the surface, not inside, right? So this is on the surface. And when you fuse hydrogen on the surface of the star, you're going to become super bright, like 10,000 times brighter. So in the sky, we call this a nova. Nova means new. And so some star in the sky that was not even visible, perhaps, now is a nova. It's visible to everybody. Everybody goes, oh, my God, it's a new star. So we get, basically, we start with an explosion. You know, it just explodes on the surface. And this is called a nova. Now we can have exactly the same scenario, except as it collects the mass, it goes over what is called Chandrasekhar limit. When it goes over Chandrasekhar limit, it doesn't just become a nova. Now it's going to become a supernova. 
He might even blow out the other star, the red giant. So that's the difference. One of them collapses into a supernova type 1A. So same exact scenario, except one of them just collects the gas, starts fusing on the surface, and then the other one goes supernova. Right, professor. Now, yes. This small, the white dwarf in there and the supernova, that was a white dwarf and a supernova together and mm -hmm. the supernova was exploding just i just want to be clear on what happened is this like a two-star system like you're talking like tattooing yeah so you saw what happened to the nova right yes all right so, so, so we had the, the accretion disc that was be from the white dwarf itself leading to the supernova that wasn't from the gases the are giant. collecting around this guy here are they is there origin from the red giant? Well, yeah, that's why it's losing. Remember, I said this guy here is so much closer now. Okay. So the gas is escaping from this guy. This guy here doesn't have any more gases on the surface. Remember, it's the white dwarf. Got it. Okay. It's about the size of the earth. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, it's done. It's dead. It's a dead corpse of a star. But now it's coming back to life again. So these white dwarfs that collect gases and start, start fusing at their surface, right? They fuse at the surface, they become super bright. Now, same scenario. I'm gonna go over it again. Somebody's got their uh, microphone on, please turn it off. All right, so now we have same exact scenario. We have an F star and a G star. Same thing happens again. So first the F star evolves into a red giant. All right, so then it evolves into a white dwarf. Well, we have the same thing. Uh, F star with a G star, with the uh, white dwarf in orbit around it. Okay, so then the G star goes red giant. Now the gases are escaping again, except this time it's much more drastic. This time it's adding to the mass of the white dwarf. When the mass of the white dwarf exceeds 1.4 times the mass of the sun, the degenerate electrons, the electron degeneracy, the electron pressure can hold up the mass of the white dwarf anymore over 1.4 times the mass of the sun. And so it goes supernova. It collapses and goes supernova. So now we have what we call supernova type 1A. This is a gigantic explosion. You can see this explosion from the end of the universe all of a sudden becomes billions of times more luminous than it used to be. This is called supernova type 1A. So now supernova type 1A is a white dwarf that goes over 1.4 times the mass of the sun. 1.4 times the mass of the sun is called Chandrasekhar limit. So when a white dwarf goes over channel Sekar limit, it collapses and it goes supernova. This is the best star for measuring distances in the entire universe, not just close to the Milky Way galaxy. We're talking about the end of the universe. You can see this from far, far, far away, billions of light years away, supernova type 1A is light up. Now what's so good about it is all stars that go supernova type 1A they're all white dwarfs, and they all go supernova exactly at 1.4 times the mass of the sun. So they all have exactly the same luminosity. Now, if you measure the distance to a supernova type 1a that's close by, like maybe uh, inside the Milky Way, maybe a thousand light years away, maybe 10,000 light years away, you can compare it to all the other supernova type 1as that you see in the entire universe and you can therefore get the distance in the entire universe. That's how we know how big the universe is, is by using these supernova type 1As in other galaxies. You can see them far, far away, so they're awesome. Now remember, when a super red super giant goes supernova, that's a core collapse. That's when the core of the star collapses and goes supernova. That's called supernova type 2. They're not useful as far as measuring distances because every supernova type 2 is a little different. 
So their luminosity vary greatly, but not supernova type 1a. These are great for measuring distances. And since they're super luminous too, you can use them for measuring distances. They're called standard candles, right? So you can use them to measure distances anywhere in the universe. All right, so supernova type 1A. Now, I think I have just the quick pictures of these. So you can see it. I made a little tiny GIF. Let's see, it goes red giant. Then it goes white dwarf. Now, it's the turn of the G start to go red giant. Now the gas escape from the red giant onto the surface of the white dwarf. And next, all hell is going to break loose. So what is the difference between supernova and a nova then? Well, the difference is one of them is extremely luminous. That's supernova type 1A. Nova is luminous, but not like a supernova. And then the other difference is that since the gases keep going, they don't stop, then the nova is repetitive. It's periodic. It can go off again and again and again, even in a man's lifetime. So I've seen a, I've seen a nova actually go off twice in my lifetime, which is pretty impressive. So supernovas are not repetitive. Once the star goes supernova, it just blows itself up. So it doesn't happen again. All right. Any questions on supernova type 1A versus regular supernova type 2? All right. So now let's take a look at the entire evolution of the stars again. So we have two types of evolution. We have an evolution where you have a gigantic cloud of gas. This guy can make maybe a thousand stars. And then we also have smaller clouds of gas where, you know, maybe a dozen protostars form. These guys here evolve into the sun and planets. Then they go red giant. After they go red giant, they go white dwarf. After they build a planetary nebula, the cocoon around them, they go white dwarf. The white dwarf cools down until it becomes a black dwarf. A possible you know, evolution of a sun-type star. Low mass stars, like less than a couple of times the mass of the sun. Not the A, B, and O stars. Now, here we said that it's possible that when it becomes a white dwarf, it can become... Uh, nova or a supernova here. So there is a possible um, possible evolution. And as you can see here, there's a little arrow here that says it can happen again and again. In other words, this guy here can become a nova again and then collect gases again, become a nova again, collect gases again, become a nova again, and so on. This guy here is a one-way trip type 1A supernova. It just goes off and that's it, destroys itself. All right, now, if you're a massive star and you are uh, O star or B star and A star, you got a lot of mass, you become red supergiant, whereas sun-type stars become a red giant. But then here you go supernova. Once you go supernova, you can either become a neutron star or you can become a black hole. If you can become a neutron star, you can also become a pulsar. A pulsar is a neutron star that happens to be sending light from its north and south magnetic poles. If the Earth is here, lined up with it, then we see pulses coming from the north or south magnetic poles of the pulsar. And of course, this is the Crab Nebula. To remember the Crab Nebula, I remember. <clears throat> Excuse me. Red lobster. Red lobster. Red supergiant. Red supergiant. The core collapses. The whole star collapses, goes supernova. And it becomes a crab nebula, a supernova remnant, right? So by remembering red lobster, you can become uh, proficient in uh, supernova type 2. Crab nebula. 
and red supergiants. So remember, red lobster, crab, stuff like that, yummies. Mm, I'm getting hungry now. 